Your Royal Highness, all my um, other uh, hosts of uh, this event, in particular the Malaysian Open University and uh, my hosts of the uh, Peace Foundation and all others, other guests of these organizations, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, usually, as a scientist, I'm asked here to present my work and the investigations in science. However, today I have been asked to talk about science itself. Science as a bridge between cultures and nations. Well, um, our world is characterized by differences. All nations of this planet are conspicuously different. The people living in these nations all differ from one another, and this, of course, is a good thing. Because of differences, there's trade between nations, there's discussion between people, and differences in time allow for progress to take place. Differences are the basics for the process of evolution and indeed the very basis of life. Also the progress in scientific thinking can only come about when different people come with different ideas, investigate different mysteries and um, following different approaches uh, to stumble upon solutions of the difficulties that they encounter. Some scientists, for instance, they spend their lives hiking through difficult terrain um, and uh, uh, some will build delicate microscopes to do their investigation, some build gigantic machines and still others do experiments only in their imagination, like in fact myself. <laughs> some investigators work with the most meticulous accuracy. Others follow wild and sloppy ideas. They all investigate the same world, the world that we live in. The world is so vast and so complex that there is place for all these people. Different nations with different ethnic, religious and cultural backgrounds all participate in the same endeavor and all of them are sometimes useful and successful while very often many attempts at disclosing the truth fail. This is our fate. There are a few things, however, that all scientific searches have in common. We build on each other's experiences and we communicate. We communicate our results to our colleagues. Science is a collective exercise. Only by being open and by using the results and the openness of others can one contribute to the scientific adventure in a meaningful way. From what I just said, it should be clear that science is not a privilege of the happy few. It cannot be confined to the white males in the industrialized countries. Thanks to a process called globalization, thanks to the internet also, we can look at the future in which underprivileged uh, people from developing countries can have access to modern scientific knowledge. A future in which all, in principle, would have equal possibilities, equal opportunities to learn and to be educated. Sure, there still are gigantic obstacles blocking these opportunities for large numbers of people. But I would also like to stress the enormously promising possibilities of the future. And I like to look ahead and speculate on how the world might come to a change in this respect. What I said actually doesn't only hold for science. It also holds for commerce, for culture, for arts, for sport. However, I believe that the scientific exchanges will have the deepest and the most lasting effects in a more distant future. Science and technology are the most essential pivots for our development. And by embracing the most modern findings, nations, nations can maneuver themselves in a position to join with the industrialization process and the associated wealth. And when I talk about wealth, I mean that in the widest sense of the word. Living a healthy life in a clean environment, 
and a stable and just social system is often an even more desirable form of wealth than just the possession of exorbitant amounts of currency. Countries that today are counted among the poorest of the underdeveloped region, regions can change tomorrow. All they need to do is join the rich nations with all the power they have and learn about their technological and scientific achievements. The obstacles are well known. Unstable, violent and corrupt political systems, ruthless military power and criminal organizations are deliberately blocking such a process. If these could be replaced today, then poverty, suppression and war could come to an end tomorrow. From a purely scientific point of view, this planet has more than the resources needed to keep its population healthy and secure, even if this population were to grow even further. Science is showing us the way. So I don't believe the uh, sometimes um, fatalistic point of view that poverty is a necessary uh, presence on our planet. If it were only for science, poverty would not simply be there. Um, so uh, what kind of science should people do in the poorest of the developing country, uh, countries, regions? There is an enormous amount of choice for poor countries to do science. And of course, one's mind drifts to those sciences from which they can benefit directly. It would be wise for uh, the inhabitants of those countries to spend research efforts on, say, environmental sciences, especially on their own environment. The science and technology of water distribution, the quality, availability and use of water, the availability of the exploitation of and the exploitation of energy resources, or food production methods, health issues, climate, and issues for, of the social sciences, like the combat of poverty, as I mentioned, class inequality, corruption and crime, for instance. However, I also believe it would be wrong for those nations only to focus on such sciences, sciences that have directly applications. If indeed the Western world would have done that, our science today, at present, would have been about how to produce cheaper and more efficient candles in the fanciest colors perhaps, while you would still not have electric light in all its varieties as we know today. However, even that is not exactly the right argument for poor countries to go into modern, pure science, the more glamorous kind of science. I believe the correct argument for that is that this is the only way to generate a class of highly skilled scientists and educators who would be the only ones able to lead the country into the 21st century and beyond. The poorest countries in general feel no constraint in buying the newest high-tech weaponry from the West. Therefore, the least thing they can do to balance that should be to also buy the, the peaceful technologies of modern science and participate with as much vigor as they can. For instance, India and China are doing this. And even though some of us in the West still regard them as third world countries, they are making serious attempts to do the most fashionable things, such as sending humans into space, firing spacecraft to the moon, and building the most state-of-the-art particle accelerator facilities. And as I'll explain, those are the most fancy things you can do, the most glamorous things you can do in science. These countries indeed possess a large enough economy to be able to afford such adventures, but in particular India also received serious criticism for doing this kind of thing, instead of spending this money on apparently more urgent issues, such as health and hunger. I think this criticism is misplaced. Scientific research of the top shelf will tremendously enhance the visibility of these countries abroad. 
will keep the most skillful scientists within their borders and generate an invaluable boost to the motivation of youngsters to get the best possible results in their education just to ensure that they will be also eventually part of the show. Abdus Salam, Nobel Prize 1979, saw this right. Abdus Salam, as you may know, he's uh, uh, from Pakistan and from India. In fact, he didn't know he was from Pakistan until later Pakistan was formed. Um, he saw this right. He, and I quote him, it is a political uh, decision of those in power, those who decide on the destiny of humanity in the underprivileged regions of the earth, whether or not they will make steps to let their people create, master, and utilize modern science and technology. In 1964, Salam founded the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. This center, now called the Abdel Salam Center for Theoretical Physics, operates under a tripartite agreement among the Italian government and two United Nations agencies, UNESCO and IAEA. Its mission is to foster advanced studies and research, especially in the developing countries. While the name of the center reflects its beginnings, which is doing theoretical physics, its activities today encompass most areas of physical sciences, including, including indeed applications. The ICTP thus focuses on developing nations. However, it does, it does produce top class physical results. And it can compete perfectly well with all other modern research institutes in the developed world. Some purely Western international scientific laboratories, such as CERN in Geneva, allow physicists from non-member states to participate in the scientific programs. The non-member states, well, uh, there are too many of them to list all of them, but you can see them on this list, the member states the observer states and the non-member states, and you see that many countries of the world are participating. Now, uh, another institution uh, where we do our best to accommodate people from developing nations uh, is the system of international summer schools. These are high quality schools for PhD students and postdocs. And uh, we have them in the United States, in France, in Europe, um, in France, for instance, in Cargès, in Corsica, in Les Ouches, a beautiful resort in the, in the French Alps, and in Italy, where I am co-directing the Erche schools of subnuclear physics. Together with the charismatic Italian professor Antonino Zichichi, who is also doing a lot, by the way, to foster science, to establish bridges and such, and, but this particular school is unique in its way that it is a balanced mix between purely theoretical investigations and fundamental experimental research. Very often people tend to specialize into one or the other, but at this school one group will learn about the results of the other groups. And they are discussing the most essential and novel developments in all big laboratories in the world. I do think that schools of this sort are bringing more understanding between nations. An understanding nourished by intensive scientific contact. Indeed, this is one of the bridges that this presentation is about. If economic wealth would have been more equally distributed across the planet, if there hadn't been social inequality and class distinctions, if it were just a question of applying science and technology, there would be no poverty, enough food, water and shelter and health care for everyone on this planet, even if the population were to go further. Today's credit crisis 
or a financial crisis, if good for anything, certainly shows that incredibly large amounts of cash exist in the rich countries. Cash that could have been applied for generating or improving the infrastructure needed to alleviate the needs of the poor, not by just handing them more money, but by improving the quality of healthcare and education, and of course by investigating and addressing the issues that actually led to war and social disruption. Often these are religious issues, a topic that I'll briefly touch upon later in this talk. Of course, I should add to this that scientists do not have the power to redistribute economic wealth. And our world cannot be turned into a utopia overnight, as mentioned earlier. What we can do as scientists is to address the education problem. Bring our message across to the people and the politicians in power, and this is indeed what I'm trying to do today. In effect, science indeed has the capacity of bringing people together with altogether different backgrounds, and even nations that are at war with one another. A perfect example of this is the so-called Sesame Project. The Sesame Project is the following thing. The idea of an international synchrotron light source, which is a topic of investigation in physics and in many other branches of science. The idea of such a, um, a facility in the Middle East was proposed in 1997 by scientists from America and Germany. Um, during two seminars uh, organized in 1997 in Italy and 1998 in Sweden uh, with a CERN-based Middle East Scientific Cooperation, Cooperation Group headed by Sergio Fubini. The German particle laboratory, DAISY, Deutsches Elektronen Synchrotron Facility, at Hamburg had just decided to decommission one of its facilities. It's called BESI-1. They always have acronyms, these machines. A newer version of which was being built in Berlin. The uh, German government agreed to donate the components of this machine to the Sesame project, provided that the dismantling was taken care of by the latter. UNESCO got involved and held a meeting about this in Paris in 1999, a meeting of the delegates from the Middle East and other countries. Jordan, which had been selected to host the center, is providing the land as well as the funds for the construction of the building. In January 2003, the center's creation was formally sealed following an exchange of correspondence between Koichiro Matsura, the Director General at the time of UNESCO, and UNESCO's member states. The first president of SESAMI was Harry Schopper, a, one of the former Director Generals of CERN itself in Geneva. From, he was from Germany. Member states are listed here again, Bahrain, Cyprus, Egypt, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Pakistan, the Palestinian Authority, and Turkey. Now I want you to focus for one moment on this bizarre list of names. These countries, many of them are at a state of war of some sort with each other, and there is continued hostility. But in spite of that, these countries are collaborating scientifically in this one project. Um, so uh, there are observer states such as uh, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Kuwait, Portugal, the Russian Federation, Sweden, United Kingdom, and the, and the United States. A pending observer state is Japan. In fact, one of the uh, pending memberships is Iraq. They also want Iraq to be involved. So now um, you see uh, the, the miracle of this. Countries of, uh, that are apparently at war with each other can collaborate scientifically. So what other bridge would you need to foster peace. Inevitably, smaller nations 
with smaller budgets tend to prefer purely theoretical research rather than getting involved with expensive experiments. This is all right as a start. There's nothing wrong with purely theoretical research. It's a lot better than nothing. In fact, I'm a theoretical physicist myself. So what can I say? But I do insist that the whole step towards hard, uh, that uh, the bold step to, uh, towards hard experimental science must also be taken. It is not easy. When I visited China 20 years ago, I saw high-tech high particle laboratories. However, instead of electric devices, they were using pulleys and other hand-operated machines uh, to lift heavy weights. Today, however, China is, is rapidly closing its gap with the Western world, indeed also spending spaceships to the moon. There is also outright opposition against the scientific method. This opposition takes various forms. The religions tend to buy scientific findings uh, as, as, as they are considered threats to their beliefs. We have a history of this in the Western world, in Europe. Most opposition has since disappeared, but there are still a few notable exceptions. One is evolution theory. It appears to contradict standard religious beliefs in various ways. First, the evolution theory sheds a very different light on the origin of mankind and its relation to animals. As well as it is establishing a vastly longer time span that evolution has taken up to, to take place. However, even more importantly, evolution theory gives a much more detailed explanation of animal and human behavior. Behavior is not imposed by laws declared by a divine being or its prophets, but behavior is, dic is dictated by the laws of nature, which can be understood by logical reasoning. This is not hard to accept that people are very religious. Uh, another point is the nature, the size, and the age of the universe. Science also shows that its existence is far longer in time than the usual creation stories. And it de-emphasizes the relevance of human existence, or in fact even any form of life in the universe. Most religious people, however, are less concerned about the latter discrepancies and they can accommodate for this in their belief system. So there appears to be no contradiction, but anyway. The third way in which uh, science is the way in which science addresses issues such as birth control, abortion, euthanasia, and the questions of sexual behavior. The natural scientific approach is that life at different stages of its development should be valued differently. A fetus of a few weeks old and a very old person close to his or her death should be valid differently from a healthy person in the height of his lifetime span. Religions usually refuse to differentiate. It is difficult, of course, to differentiate between humans since history, even modern history, has shown the disastrous consequences of applying any kind of distinction. So whenever a religious system uh, uh, provides rules to live by, exact equality is usually by far the best choice that we can agree on, upon. However, questions as to how to judge the very, very beginning of life and, or the very end of our lives, that is a subject that has to be addressed and science is addressing these subjects and religions often refuse to. Now, other religions and nations add their own problems of science. During my visit, for instance, of Riyadh, I noted that the Saudis tended to restrict themselves only to th three very traditional themes. One was lunar science, allowing Arab scientists to study lunar rocks, for, rocks, for example. The science of topography, giving them access to GPS technology. And the science of cryptography, allowing mathematicians to study number theories. 
and there are historical reasons and religious reasons why those sciences were preferred. I think a tendency to this should be discontinued. I think even Arab people, just like the people in all our other nations, should be strongly encouraged to study all aspects of modern science. I sincerely hope that the internet revolution will accomplish this. With full access to all sites of the World Wide Web, investigators should no longer be inhibited in any way. Governments, however, must also encourage their scientists to become acquainted with all aspects of modern science. Continuing on this line of thought, I also hope that the Internet will be instrumental in establishing a more democratic world order. Although, of course, many other things might happen instead. Anyone can add his or her messages on the Internet and consequently, consequently it is possible to be entirely misled by reading the Internet. All I can say is that I have good hopes for the good intentions of a big majority of Internet users and chatters. And you see that happening. People's not, the world is not as hostile as some people think. Not only is there opposition against some well-established fields of science, there are other ways in which science is under threat. There are charlatans, those who hope to become the new messiahs of entirely new fields, often directly contradicting established science. We know of numerous examples. My initial remarks about diversity also apply here. People are vastly different from one another. It is difficult to describe in a few lines all these different personalities who attempt to overthrow some established pieces of wisdom. What they often have in common is a lack of self-discipline, self-criticism, that would normally lead one to compare one's results with those of the professional scientists elsewhere. Once you start to believe that your own concoction is superior, there appears to be no way back. Then you are a maverick, a self-proclaimed scientist, and what often emerges next is a severe feeling of pain and injustice. Professional science is not taking any notice at all of these mavericks, uh, new ideas, and this creates tension. Since Albert Einstein was a mythical figure in a sense, his theories of relativity are often the subject of maverick theories. Fortunately, relativity theory is so clearly understood by most theoretical physicists that they can make short work of the crackpots here. Sometimes, refutation takes more effort. From time to time, a scientist unable to accept the refutation of his or her ideas may become fairly violent. However, these really are exceptions. Sometimes the borderline between real science and pseudoscience is not easy to draw. There are also stubborn examples of pseudoscience or metaphysics. See, for example, the extensive research attempts concerning so-called paranormal phenomena. These are called paranormal because they are in conflict with normal phenomena, which are usually described by science in all their details. In my view, paranormal means not properly fitting in the scientific picture. And as such, uh, needs to be severely questioned. It is the experience of a vast majority of scientists that scientific findings are not in conflict with each other. And whenever it happens that conflict seemed, a conflict seems to be observed, this is usually due to inaccuracies. We are human beings and as such not immune against human failures and mistakes. The best advice I can give here is always to stay as critical as possible. Particularly when results are claimed that seem to be irreconcilable with things, with established wisdom, things we thought we knew. It does happen, of course, very occasionally, that new approaches lead to entirely new insights that overthrow the old establishments. But much more often, there are gradual improvements and not revolutions at all. It is important that I spend a few words on pseudoscientists at this occasion, since sadly, 
developing countries often provide a rich breeding ground uh, for such people. And more remarks about good science and bad science can be found, in fact, on my own web pages. Um, science cannot do without the highest quality of education. Our society, even that of underprivileged countries, is based on science. Only those nations that invest heavily in the education of their people at all levels will be able to generate their own scientific elite. And only those nations can subsequently take their future in their own hands. In fact, I've often been asked, how can it be that in the Netherlands, with 16 million people at present, but only actually 5.1 million people in the beginning of the 20th century, that the Netherlands had so many outstanding scientists, including several Nobel Prize winners, Particularly in the first half of the 20th century, we had Van het Hof, Lorenz, Zeeman, Van der Waals, Kameling Onnes, Eindhoven, Eckman, De Beye, Zernike, and, uh, and that's a, quite a list of Nobel laureates. In the biography of Kameling Onnes, written by Dirk van Delft, it is obvious why these people were so outstanding. In 1863, a new educational system had been introduced in the Netherlands by the politician called Johan Rudolf Torbecke, who realized that the existing classical education system, which only existed for a happy elite, was not suitable for a larger part of the population. He, he realized that the larger part of the population should have a new education system, which he called Higher Civil Civilian School. There, the modern languages would be taught, together with mathematics, physics, chemistry, and all other topics that would be useful to civilians. A whole new generation of civilians emerged, and whoever wanted to go into science had a good idea of following this new school system, and where uh, a new uh, generation of scientists was being created who not only understood their own language Dutch but also English, French and German. Scientists such as Zeeman and Kameling Onnes could not only read all papers in these languages but also address the authors of these papers in their own tongue. They also started their research with high skills in mathematics, physics and chemistry. Thus it should have been no surprise that excellent scientists emerge from such a background. Unfortunately, today, many experts have reformed the education system in the Netherlands again, to such a degree that now a majority of inhabitants receive a highly criticized kind of education, but highly skilled pupils no longer get what, what they really would want. That, uh, the number of excellent students and researchers seems to be decreasing. Of course, also, the circumstances in my country are changing. Only one language, English, is needed to be able to do good science. So that physicists from English-speaking nations are now having a slight advantage. While nearly the entire globe now manages to communicate in that language. But the lesson is clear concentrate on good education. Good education begins at the earliest stages, kindergarten, primary school, secondary school. Until age 16 or 18, education should be the very priority for all children, after which they might wish to, to continue to specialize by choosing from a wide range of possible uh, different educational systems. Education must also be seen as a bastion against extremism. Extreme ideas of religious, nationalistic or ethnic nature usually foster from ignorance. Youngsters with good educations are much more exposed to people from nations with totally different cultural and ethnic backgrounds and are more prone to the idea that the entire planet is inhabited by only one human race. Homo sapiens. In this sense, then, science can also act as a bridge between nations. 
extreme excitement is raised by the most glorious aspect of science, the Nobel Prizes and humanity's attempts to conquer outer space. Finally, I'm returning to the subject of religion. It is sad to observe time and again that humanity takes its refuge to beliefs from sources that one is not allowed to question and that are sometimes at odds with scientific findings in a blatant fashion. These belief systems often inspire to commit violence not because the religion itself provokes directly the violence, but because believers see no other way to impose their religious and uh, sometimes distorted views. A major fraction of humanity cannot live without some form of religion, however. And um, this is because religion seems to be answering very important questions that science cannot answer. The first set of questions concerns the question as to why are we here? What is the purpose of life? How did life get started and how will it end? The second set of questions is about justice. Why is it that during their lifespan wrongdoers are not always punished? And why are honesty, sincereness and love not always rewarded? Should, couldn't that be, it be such that there is an afterlife? An afterlife where all these apparent shortcomings are being corrected. And religions give answers to this. The third set of questions is one of morale. How should we behave? How can we please our creator so that we can expect a pleasant afterlife after, uh, after this uh, life? Now, in my opinion, the standard religions do not give the scientifically most credible answers. And uh, there is uh, room for, science, for religious feelings, even if you are a scientist. Uh, feelings uh, with which one can address such questions without this time being at odds with any scientific findings. This is very important for a scientist such as me, that we want to understand this world and nevertheless also have a proper place for our religious feelings. And, um, however, reality, from a scientific point of view, is quite a bit harsher than the pleasant but often incorrect answers given by most religions. The answers given in the old books are wanting, in my opinion, just because these books are written at a time that many scientific facts were simply not yet known. If you think about these things as a scientist, or at least the way I think about these things, one can indeed give beautiful and satisfactory answers to all these questions, without creating the slightest friction with the things we actually know from science. And I would be happy to tell you more about these things, however, I'm not a missionary. Nobody has to embrace my religion because I will be preaching it, far from that. I would say these things merely because of the attitude I would recommend to the pure scientist when he or she wishes to supplement a scientific worldview with a spiritual one, one without raising internal conflicts. Science as such, realizes some of the things I said may have sounded naive. Maybe with science, problems um, and, and disagreements and war, even with science, they will not go away overnight. But I hope that I succeeded in conveying the message that a scientific attitude will be the best starting point to make a difference. And this, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, my name is Lal, uh, International Association for Peace, not as well known as IPF, but I'd like to work closely with IPF in the future. Um, I was a student of physics uh, in the early 60s at the University of Malaya. I did not get very far, not having the IQ that you have, perhaps. But um, 
I'd like to ask you whether the X and Y particles are still coming, because uh, there's a gap, huh? uh, and whether in fact we've reached the final particle in physics, the, 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 the end of it all. Um, now, also I want to ask you if one day in the distant future the whole universe as we know it today will disappear into a black hole. And also this brings me to this question of how much we know as human beings of life, natural laws and afterlife. Yeah? What percentage of total knowledge do we possess at this stage in our civilization? And also, since you're a constitutional expert, I wonder if you could have a look at the Malaysian constitution. There are a couple of articles in it which is causing us some stress at the moment. Perhaps you could study it and give us your views in the, in the near future. It might help. And for the IPF, I'd like to inform you that we've had in the last month the Global Peace Forum here in Malaysia, and also the International Association of Education, Educators for World Peace here, and this is a fitting continuation. Now, the important point here is that we need to bring all these forces for peace together. I, I presume under the auspices of the United Nations, and I wonder whether IPF can do it. I, I cannot do. Um, and last point that I want to touch on is that... Your question, please. Yeah, the, the question is, is there. Now, the last point is this. The invasion of Iraq set, put back the peace movement by several years. And I hope we can now get back on track. Thank you, that's all. Well, these are about a dozen questions. Um, your first question is concerned science itself, and since I am a theoretical physicist, I'm very much interested in these questions. I love to address these points, I'll, but I'll be very brief because this is not really a, a talk about science itself, because uh, you are asking about the ultimate unification of all particles and fields in, in, uh, uh, in, in a sort of over uh, all-encompassing theory. And people were occasionally thinking about these things in the 60s, but this subject became much closer after, in fact, uh, we started to understand much better how the subatomic particles work. And as such, we could now probe matter much, much deeper than in the past. So now, 40 years later, we can address this question with much more vigor. But in spite of this, we are still very far away from the final answers. There, is, there are various theories which have some degree of credibility. That yes, we believe that all different forces that are being uh, examined today have one and the same common origin at extremely high energy or what's equivalent at very, very short distance scales. Um, but exactly how it works is still not known. We don't talk so much about X and Y particles anymore, but there are a whole range of names of particles one can think of in these theories. Uh, then uh, uh, you asked something about the, the final stages of the, of the universe. As we know it today from observations, the universe appears to expand indefinitely, and therefore there's no sign for any tendency of the universe to go back into a shrinking mode where it will disappear into a black hole. So that doesn't seem to be the case as far as we understand today. All evidence is that the universe continues to expand and therefore not go into a black hole. So the answer to that question is very probably not, or many of us should be dead wrong in our calculations and observations. Um, uh, yeah, there was a question about life. Um, 
but I forgot what actually the question was. Um, well, well the one question is whether life can be included in our scientific research. Of course it can. There is a lot of biological research on life today. Very different what it was uh, when I grew up and when I was studying biology, I thought biology was a very difficult science because it didn't explain anything. And uh, it just described things that happened but didn't really explain them. And the laws that they were trying to explain to me was laws of evolution which I could not understand. Now this has changed enormously with advances in understanding in biology, in particular the DNA molecules. We now understand at a molecular level what is actually happening when life forms evolve and differentiate. Not all of it is understood far from it, but at least we now have some idea about how all this can come about. How evolution actually fits with the other forms of science, in particular with the science of physics and chemistry and mathematics. It's not a different science. All these sciences are very strongly connected into one worldview about how things take place. So that includes, in particular, the origin and the evolution of life. Um, again, many answers are still not there. Uh, science is, is only at the beginning. You asked you know, how many percentage of, 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 of our understanding now uh, is answering the question and I, I can only say well you can't give an answer to that except saying it's very small. There's still a lot, a lot of, of misunderstanding and things which we are very puzzled about which are left for the future to investigate. It's not obvious that humanity will ever find all the answers to all questions. In fact, quite likely we'll never find all answers to all questions but there's an enormous future ahead of us. We can proceed much, much further than we can do now. And as one of our messages of this talk is that I want all nations of the entire planet, all people of the planet who have the opportunity and the wish to become scientists should be allowed to do so and to participate. And in fact, this very important piece of message here is also, which I haven't yet mentioned, is that you don't have to be a Nobel laureate to, to um, contribute uh, in an essential way to science. If you look at all of science in this world and you ask which percentage of that science has been actually discovered by Nobel laureates, it's, it's practically zero. It's a very, very small percentage. All the other scientific facts that we, in all the textbooks today have been discovered by scientists who did not never reach the status of Nobel laureate, but who made small but essential contributions, who wrote textbooks, who put uh, order in our knowledge, who, uh, who distributed knowledge to other people. All these people have made essential contributions but were not rewarded by Stockholm. So, um, and, but in spite of that, there's still an enormous future in front of us that, that still has to be... Um, uh, where we expect, have enormously high expectations of further improvement. You asked me something about the Malaysian constitution, unfortunately there I'm certainly not an expert. I'm only an expert on the constitution on this very small asteroid <laughs> in heaven and I think all lawyers will laugh at my institution because it is a joke, it is not meant seriously. So I'm afraid, but um, I believe you when you say that there are articles, like in any nations, we always have situations where we don't agree. I mean, uh, this would, be, would not be our world if there would have been no disagreements. Disagreement itself is fine. It's, it is a cause for discussion. And we discuss at length about it. Only if, if um, certain articles are being maintained by force rather than by argument, by discussion, then there's a problem. So if you have a problem with, with things that exist in the political system of your country, you should try to, to bring this, these topics on in discussion. And that should be in the newspapers, in the other media, or uh, somehow you should have your voice heard and argue and dispute. And I think only by uh, trying to reach agreement and by seriously doing that, you might be able to have 
to, to realize the changes in the direction that you think uh, is fit. But if nobody else in this country agrees with you, then I don't think there's much chance that you'll succeed. And um, uh, so in, indeed you ask about uh, agencies being able to establish peace. Well, we've heard it over and over again how difficult that is. And actually, I emphasize, I started my talk by saying that people are different. Nations are different. And in particular, the interests of nations and the interests of people are very often in conflict. Think of, of conflicts about water, about border disputes, uh, uh, conflicts between people, who gets a higher income than who else, uh, uh, how do you establish these things. There are always conflicts of interest. So conflicts of interest are there, and so therefore there should be negotiations among people. But negotiations themselves could be done in a peaceful manner. When a war breaks out, then something has gone wrong with these negotiations in in a way which many of us find unacceptable. If you go to war to get uh, your will established, if, if it can't be done in a peaceful way, you've made the wrong decision. And I think many of us agree with that. Um, that discussion is the way. But um, to get complete agreement and complete peace will probably be impossible simply because there are conflicts of interest. In fact, I also said in the beginning that differences are the basis of life. One life form lives by eating another life form. That's not very peaceful. And uh, however, among people and nations, it's a little bit the same way. Some nations live by suppressing other nations. So it's getting very hard to get complete peace in this world for these very simple things which you can investigate scientifically. But that doesn't mean that it's hopeless. All you have to do is establish the causes of the conflict and agree, or get at least agreement that there should be some impartial agency that should force a decision one way or the other in the most just, uh, justified way. And this is, of course, the way in which we should try to establish peace. Um, and, uh, well, you just mentioned the example of Iraq. Well, that country is in a very difficult position today. So it's not the best example of, uh, of how we can get peace in the world. But, um, um, well, there's many things to say about that, but then you really end with politics. I am the worst politician on the whole planet, so I don't think you have to discuss such issues with me. Okay, my name is Shao, I represent Forward Magazine. I just want to ask a question about religion and science, because there are two fundamental differences between religion and science. There was, I remember there was this time when the Islamic Empire, but when people are relig religious, but they are scientists. Do you see a convergence, uh, something like that, in the future? That's my question. Thank you. In this issue, again, I, I'm going to repeat myself, there are differences. And certainly among scientists, there are as many differences as everywhere else on, uh, on the population. So no two scientists will give you the same answer. So um, uh, there are certainly ways in which science and religion can be merged in a way which I would not agree. I mean, there, there are scientists who are in, at the same time uh, deep believers of some, uh, some religious system, and they, they manage to combine their beliefs with their science in a way that I don't agree with. I can only say, as a scientist, you are allowed and encouraged to think about these topics. Uh, scientists usually do not accept authority. So, um, so normally religions are based on some form of authority. There's a Bible, there's a Quran, there are other uh, uh, holy books which by definition are, are the definition of authority. You're not allowed to question what's in there. This is not the way a scientist acts. A scientist doesn't even accept authority of Einstein. Absolutely not. Einstein indeed did make mistakes. And so did all the other great scientists. I, certainly make mistakes myself, if that comes to a question. So, uh, we all make mistakes, and so none of us has absolute authority. And so, uh, so a scientist, therefore, by the very nature of his profession, would not accept the authority of a holy book, unless you somehow manage to split yourself in a way you accept this authority, but not the rest of science. It's fine if you want to do it that way, but that's not my way. So, uh, not accepting authority means that you have to think yourself. 
we used to think, the scientists should think about everything. So, um, uh, so I think you have to find your own answers. Of course, you can be inspired by holy books as much as you want. In fact, there are very many good things in the Bible, in the Quran, and so on, that you may be inspired by. So, for, uh, laws of behavior, uh, uh, laws of, uh, uh, of explanations, or a, a feeling of awe for the creation, all that is fine. We at least scientists have that as much as, uh, as other people have. So, um, so there are different answers to the questions and I'm sure if any one of my colleagues would be standing here, he or she would give a different answer than I do. But I think you have to think about these things yourself and find the answer that pleases yourself most, that is as most in agreement with your other scientific beliefs. Because even science is often sometimes based on belief. Nothing is absolutely true, but some things are very, very likely true. This world is approximately a sphere, and it's floating in the, in, in the universe, in orbit of other spheres. This is practically a truth, a scientific truth. But what is absolutely true in science, some people dispute that many things we know are not absolute truths, but simply very, very likely. So. Uh, Extrapolating this, there are many, many things about this world that we scientists say, these are so likely to be true, I accept this as my belief system, as a truth. And then I want to combine that with the other truths where it's much more difficult to find any proof, like the existence of God or whatever. And um, then you add that to your belief system in such a way that there's no conflict with anything you find in, in your uh, uh, scientific research. Uh, now, with the advancement of computer and information technology, the knowledge and information can travel the world at the speed of light. Yes. Okay. Uh, and you, as the uh, particular physicist and also the uh, fiction writer, do you believe in teleportation that we can travel you know, uh, everywhere to the past and to the present? Because uh, I sometimes dream of traveling the universe. <laughs> So, because and also in our in Quran, it, it does mention something about teleportation. My second question is about uh, war and peace. <coughs> okay, uh, after the first and the second world war, we were yeah, in the Cold War of the bipolar war, and we had a lot of peace. Then, after the collapse of Berlin War, suddenly we faced a long war. Yeah, as in the case in Iraq and Afghanistan. Maybe this is uh, because due to the foreign policy of Bush. So, uh, do we have hopes in Obama to bring peace to the world? Thank you. Okay, I like, I like your first question about teleportation. Um, with the advance of computers, you said, well, um, in, indeed nowadays information can be spread over this planet with the speed of light, or even if it's one tenth of the speed of light, that's still very, very fast. And that is just what I was trying to say when I was mentioning the internet, that nowadays scientific findings can be uh, distributed over the entire planet extremely fast. And so uh, I think with all, not only scientific, but all information, and with that, our planet suddenly has become much smaller because distances have decreased so much because we can travel so easily and we can communicate so easily over large distances that those distances seem to disappear. And that's a way of saying that our planet now seems to be very small, like a place for just only one human race and one nation, uh, so that um, there is no longer a need for, uh, for war between different nations just because our, the world order is going to be different. Uh, people can now live in, on, on different sides of the globe, yet be close friends and talk at, at, on a daily basis with each other. It wasn't like that 30 or 40 years ago. And so the world then was very, very big and there were conflicts often based on complete misunderstanding. People on one side of the globe did not understand what drives and motivates people on the other side of the globe. All this is changing now. And I hope with also the intervention of science itself and people who 
who understand the origin of these differences, that we can obtain a new world order in, in which there is more room for peace. Although, as I said also before, absolute peace is probably impossible. Um, and that holds for a particular First and Second World War. The Cold War, just because of this Berlin Wall or the other entire Iron Curtain that we had during a very long time after, world, after the Second World War, that was also blocking information. But with the advances of computers, it became harder and harder to block information the way this wall was originally designed. So information was getting from one part to the other part anyway, and this wall became uh, ineffective, and it could just as well be, be brought down. So, um, so that was a, an advance in, in, in a very good sense due to the computer. Now you mentioned teleportation. Teleportation is a notion of science fiction. And uh, although even some scientists say that the principle is described in a scientific way and we have at the atomic level, we could teleport uh, one atom to another place uh, in a way that scientists, that, that science fiction authors think about teleportation of entire people from one place to another. But I, I think that this is simply too great and I would just uh, delegate that that topic to the topic of science fiction. It is not real science and so you should not uh, even dream that the notion of teleportation as described in science fiction novels, that that is anything close to reality. Uh, I don't believe that anything like that will ever be, be uh, reached. Even though, as I said, distances on the planet shrink, the planet becomes shorter, you can travel faster, but you still need an airplane to go from one place to the other. <laughs> Um, now, uh, and, and then you have some questions about, uh, well, about recent history. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the war against terrorism, uh, which is a terrible thing from both sides. Of course, uh, the, uh, I think the, the, the uh, motivation for people to become terrorists is totally misplaced and uh, is not the way to resolve disputes between anybody, anywhere, so it's a very crazy phenomenon that this is happening in this world to such an extent. Whenever we travel, we see that terrorists are, are trying to make travel more difficult. So they are trying to hold back this development of reducing the size of the planet. Um, but I don't think they'll succeed. Science always, and technology always finds ways to allow people to travel anyway. And, but also the combat against terrorism, I think, is based on, on misplaced beliefs that you can have a war against terrorism. I don't think it's possible to have a war. I think there could be a, a, a scientific problem. How can we, how can we um, take away the motivations of terrorists to, to, um, to have these ideas? How can we, uh, in fact, combat them in a scientifically meaningful way, and um, uh, that should not imply war. You should not try to eliminate terrorists. You should try to eliminate the ideas they have. And that's much harder, but that's the way, I think, to combat terrorism. And uh, as for Obama, I simply, well, he's, he's a new figure in the political world, and so we know actually very little of him. So how big, how high we should have, uh, our expectations of him should be, I don't know. My hope is, of course, that he will, um, he will have a different attitude towards the problems that the world is facing today, and the world is facing a lot of problems. This financial crisis is, is a relatively small problem. It affects the rich, but not the poor. So in that respect, the, uh, the problem might not be as, uh, as as deep and, uh, and, and problematic, but it has to be addressed. But there are more urgent problems of the distribution of wealth on the planet, the climate problem, uh, the environment. All these issues have to be addressed. I believe that these issues have to be addressed scientifically. And it means that all scientists of the entire globe should unite and join and and discuss these problems among them. Again, there will not be complete agreement about how to, to, to address these problems in a, in a completely meaningful way, but at least there will be some agreement about which methods should be used to address the problems, and, um, and, and then 
uh, how should we, in a peaceful way, find, find solutions? I am uh, Professor David Quack from University of Malaya. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Hu, for your interesting idea on scientific thinking and good scientists. Uh, that raises some issue in my thoughts here. Regarding good scientists, um, how do, how, or rather, what are some of the points that you can give us for helping us to develop good scientists in our country? We trained um, many young people in various professions. I'm a career counsellor, so I'm very, very interested in how do you develop a good scientists for developing countries? Right. Especially, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, just now you raised the issue that in developing countries, there are many pseudo-scientists. And the other issue is, right, how do you overcome this if there are? And then how do you help us to develop a critical mass for us to move into a cave society? Thank you. Uh, I, I think I addressed this already briefly, but... Um, uh, first of all, good science comes from good education and a good cultural background, the worst thing you can do is the things that happened in China, for instance, Cultural Revolution, and in Cambodia, where also the, the, um, the, the intelligentsia of, of the country was simply being eliminated. So the, um, the scientific establishment, or the, perhaps you could call it an elite, people who think with their heads and uh, not with their guns, uh, that uh, people who, who address problems that way uh, should be listened at and should give the examples and um, uh, those examples should should be the guidelines for uh, the educational system so they establish a, um, a an atmosphere of, of thinking and that is, I think, it happened in my country, in, a, in particular in the beginning of the 20th century, where an atmosphere of scientific thinking had been created. That's the first thing you need. And uh, you need that by having good education systems, by, by paying attention to the way teachers teach their subject in a meaningful way. Um, to eliminate bad science, that is quite a difficult problem. And um, the only thing is, again, set good examples and to give some, um, some uh, guidelines about how to think correctly. And one of the guidelines is criticism and that you, sh you should listen to everyone who has critical remarks about your results or about other results and to listen to those remarks uh, carefully without trying to overshout them. And very often you see that bad signs is characterized by people who start shouting and who start to close their eyes against criticism. That's not right. Anybody who has a critical remark to be made about any scientific result should at least be listened at. And instead of sh start to shout, you should start to argue. Why do you believe this criticism is misplaced? Or, why, or perhaps you could say, wait a minute, what you said is very interesting, it changes my view. And you should allow the possibility that someone who asks a critical question or puts a critical remark at the results that, that someone has found might, have the, the, might possibly have the effect of changing one's, one's uh, vision about a subject. So don't try to close your eyes against your ears and eyes against criticism, but say, wait a minute, if, if something happens, then, then um, if some statement of this sort uh, are made, this might possibly change my view about reality. And science also is about changing views of the correct answers. As long as we keep that in mind, and we should also not accept authorities. Uh, you listen to authorities, you take the advice very seriously, but if your own conclusion is different, you should adhere to that and not uh, take the author authoritarian answer against all the odds, which happened in the past. In Europe itself, science has been held back for a thousand years because people took the authority of the Greeks literally. What the Greeks in the, in the ancient times had said was by definition correct, and 
Therefore, uh, if, you, if you question that, you're not a good scientist. Well, this is the dark ages in Europe when that kind of thing happens. So this is not the correct attitude. Listen to the authorities, you can respect them, but if you, you, you reach a different conclusion, then, and if you can defend that conclusion against all criticism, then that's the preferred answer. Thank you.